Yeah. So I, I've always been uh, obsessed with this uh, notion of um, the methodologies that we use to investigate uh, what neurons like, uh, meaning uh, what kind of visual stimuli trigger uh, neuronal firing. Now normally what everybody in the field does is just show them thousands of natural images and find out that they're, they like to respond to particular kinds of images like faces or hands or bodies. But that's always a hypothesis and you can't possibly test all natural images. So I've been posing this question to students in a class that I teach at Harvard. I was new to the field and I was basically really excited about the idea of you know brains and neural networks and generative adversarial neural networks. Those are all very hot topics and really cool ideas to me, so I wanted to find a way to put them all together. Uh, and Will, uh, who's one of the first authors, was one of the students in this, in this class, and, and, and he took out this question as a challenge, and, and during um, his homework, uh, he came up with the idea of uh, trying to combine uh, generative algorithms with genetic algorithms to try to let the neuron dictate uh, what it likes. One day, I received an email from Gabriel Kreiman telling me that he and a rotating student in his lab, Will Xiao, had developed a way to discover internal representations hidden in some artificial neurons of convolutional neural networks. And they could demonstrate that through a process that involved a genetic algorithm in combination with a generative adversarial network, they could evolve pictures that gave rise to activity in the cell that superseded those of natural images, including the ones that had been used to train the very same convolutional neural networks. And they asked me whether it was possible to translate this into primate electrophysiology. So I have a lab that records from infrotemporal cortex in macaque monkeys, and this student who was doing a rotation project, Will Sow, came up with a program that would allow us to use neural networks to explore a huge image space to try to figure out what, what are the optimum images for infrotemporal cortex neurons. We did these experiments with chronically implanted arrays and rhesus macaques. And these arrays allow us to study the same population of neurons across days. So we basically put a neuron online together in a closed loop with a generative neural network. And we put a genetic algorithm on top of this so that the responses of the neurons can be used to guide the evolution of images that's made by the generative network so that these images become progressively better for the neuron. So he and Carlos and Peter together figured out how to integrate Will's program with our physiology rigs, which was non-trivial because you have to have three computers talking to each other constantly and analyzing data and generating images. I remember lots of shouting because we had to be in different rooms. And I remember for the first few days not getting many interesting results until finally one day we seemed to hit it and we saw that many of the cells that we were recording from began to exhibit increases in firing rate while at the same time the images began to take form. Over an hour or two we would watch Will's algorithm and a generative network turn these black and white textures into these colorful scenes. It worked so well the neuron we were recording from evolved something that looked just like a monkey face except it was distorted in a way that was really interesting. Everybody in the lab went crazy. And then a few days later, another cell evolved something that looked just like one of the care staff wearing the blue PPE that we all wear when we go in the monkey rooms. And all of this happening in a part of the brain that people used to think cared about much lower level information. So when we saw this uh, uh, stimuli emerge, uh, it, it was eye-opening. It was uh, uh, essentially opening the doors to a completely new world of images uh, that's distinct from anything that anyone had ever tried uh, so far. That was one of the most exciting moments in my scientific career. So this is the first time that we have, have a sense of uh, neuronal preferences dictated by the neuron itself. And this was like uh, creating something out of nothing at all. In this research, we brought together tools and approaches from both computer science and visual neuroscience research. And we developed a tool that's really useful for neuroscience research, but can also be informative for the study of artificial neural networks as well. I am incredibly proud of this paper, and I really have to give credit to the team. This was one of those efforts that, for which everybody was essential, and everybody contributed something very important to it. I hope to continue this type of collaboration in the future with the CBMM community. It's an amazing community.